all set. One of the greatest privileges I have at Duke is to be invited to teach undergraduates for one course each fall semester. The course is in public policy and it's called Ethics in an Unjust World. I tell the students I call it everything I was cross about when I was 19. <laughs> I assume that the students are distressed about the unfairness and injustice and suffering in the world. I expose them to helpful texts, challenging site visits, provocative interviews and interactive lectures. I seek to pass on to them such wisdom as I've gleaned in the last 25 years about how to address social disadvantage. I then invite them to spend the rest of their lives going deeper and doing better than I've done. At the start of the semester, I ask the whole class, how many of you have done an extended service project like a mission trip or a summer internship for a non-profit? Of the 150 or so students who've taken the course, almost every hand has gone up. And then I ask, and how many of you have done a 10 or 15 page class paper reflecting on the experience? No hands, or perhaps over each year, maybe one or two per year. Think about what this exercise tells us about the way we organize our lives today. We have a tremendous thirst for experience. The students in my class haven't just done amazing service projects. They've done them in every imaginable part of the world. Their resumes are bulging with experience. Meanwhile, they've done a lot of study. They've taken courses on a dazzling range of subjects from some of the great professors of today and tomorrow and read great works from yesterday and the day before yesterday. But where does all this knowledge and experience percolate into wisdom? Could it possibly be that we're anxious about wisdom? So we avoid the moment of truth by simply accumulating more and more knowledge and experience. Is that why we're always in such a hurry? lest anyone call us to account for a wisdom we fear we don't have. Another question I ask the class is, have you ever heard a school or college administrator or professor say, we're here to help you discover your deepest passion and then to show you ways you can pursue that passion wherever it may lead? Whenever I ask undergraduates that, they giggle and roll their eyes and say they've heard that speech 40 times. <laughs> so then I ask, have you ever heard someone say, some passions are good passions to follow and some not so good? We're here to inspire and cultivate good passions in you and help you discover ways to turn your transitory desires into lifelong loves to explore your passing passions until you find your true vocation. No, they say, I've never heard that speech. So that's the speech I've come to give you tonight. Hold tight. <laughs> I'm going to start with a pretty big question. What's the essential problem of human existence? I want to dig inside this question to identify the answer I think most people <coughs> in the church and elsewhere would most probably give to the question. I want not just to name that answer but to explore it in such a way that we can see how that answer shapes a number of things that we do. Here's my hypothesis. Our culture's operational assumption has long been that the central problem of human existence is mortality. From the moment we, do, we, we come into the world, our fundamental crisis is that we're going to die. 
we're going to die. In the words of Samuel Beckett, we give birth a stride of a grave. The light gleams an instant, then it's night once more. Given that eternity is rather extensive by anyone's measure, <laughs> any limited lifespan that falls short of eternity is bound to be unsatisfactory. And threescore years and ten are not inherently less adequate than a million or two. As Isaac Watts, recalling the words of Second Peter, reminds us in his celebrated hymn, A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. But the issue isn't simply that life is limited in terms of duration. Human flourishing is circumscribed by a host of other limitations. If we simply invoke nine, we might note disability, chronic ill health and terminal illness, poverty, hardship and malnutrition, adverse weather, famine and limited natural resources. It's a formidable list. We're hemmed in on all sides, not just by death, but by a host of other constraints. What I believe has changed in perhaps the last 50 or 60 years is that at least in the West, humanity no longer feels such limitations are integral to its existence. There was a time when death and taxes named the unshiftable givens of human experience and that life was a largely stoic matter of learning to live within the boundaries of limited human potential. Death took place in the home, most illnesses had little or no chance of a cure, and it was best to prepare oneself for a fragile existence or face hubristic <coughs> disappointment or humiliation. The world's resources may have held enormous potential, but the technology and techniques for tapping that potential were still in their infancy. But those days have gone. A cascade of technological advance in fields such as medicine, transport and information transfer has made such constraints seem absurd rather than necessary. The human project is no longer about coming to terms with limitations and flourishing within them. It's now almost without question about overcoming and transcending limitations. Human contingency is to be swept aside like racist legislation during the civil rights movement. It's not something we learn to live with, it's something we expect to conquer. Doing so is part of our self-assertion, our full expression, our spreading of our wings. It has more or less become the defining project of the human race. It seems all are agreed that the key project of our species is the alleviation, overcoming and transcendence of mortality. We achieve this by inventing new medications, discovering new dimensions of experience, reducing or reversing limitations such as blindness, breaking athletic records and circumventing such tragedies as famine or muscular dystrophy. That's what we strive for, that's what gains outstanding individuals, rewards and acclaim, that's what our society prizes most highly. In the Middle Ages, the most celebrated moments were the discovery of precious documents from the classical period. Each one represented a reclaiming of a piece of and an avenue into a lost golden era. Today, the golden moments are the transcending of another dimension of human limitation. When we advertise our organizations, we seldom still say, making lead pencils the same way for 150 years. <laughs> Instead, we say, testing and stretching the boundaries of knowledge, making the impossible possible. The single notion that sums up this sense of throwing off limitations is freedom. And the term we employ to commodify freedom and give it retail value is choice. 
So the basic line in promoting what we do is to say our product or service overcomes one or more of the real or perceived constraints of your daily or lifelong existence and thus gives you more choice. Now, when an organization wants to feel it's addressing wider human needs and not just feathering its own nest, it encourages its members to address what it perceives as the fundamental problem of human existence. Efforts towards that end are what the church calls mission and the world calls service. Mission concerns God's hopes for the world and the church's role in bringing those hopes about. Service is the recognition that there's a lot more to the world than the activities that yield an income, and that however much benefit many people may derive from those activities, there are a great many more who derive little or none, and whose needs, if they're to be noticed and responded to, have to be addressed in voluntary ways. What I want to highlight right now is that if you assume that the fundamental human problem is mortality, and if the great majority of your institutional endeavor is committed to creating opportunities for people to overcome the world's limitations and their own, then it's highly likely that you'll configure service and mission in corresponding terms. You'll be upholding the Millennium Goals. You'll be providing artificial limbs for use by people in war zones who've been maimed by landmines. You'll be digging wells for people in locations where there's a dearth of fresh water. When the human problem is mortality, then this is what mission and service are. They're generous acts of reducing mortality, alleviating human limitation in ways that are not income generating but are nonetheless life-enhancing for both giver and receiver. So that's my hypothesis. Most educated people in our culture assume the fundamental human problem is mortality, specifically, and human limitation more generally. But here's my argument. What if it turned out that the fundamental human problem wasn't mortality after all? What if it turned out that all along the fundamental human problem was isolation? What do I mean by this? If the fundamental human problem is isolation, then the solutions we're looking for don't lie in the laboratory or the hospital or the frontiers of human knowledge or experience. Instead, the solutions lie in things we already have, most of all in one another. Let me explain this asking a basic theological question. Why do Christians, to use conventional and familiar language, want people to be saved? An obvious answer might be because those people are going to die and maybe they'll go to hell or oblivion or nothingness or whatever the latest term for downstairs happens to be. <laughs> but if you say, and what's so great about going to heaven then? What kind of an answer do you get? Heaven is, I would suggest, the state of being with God and being with one another and perhaps also being with the renewed creation. In other words, a heaven that's simply and only about overcoming mortality is an eternal life that's not worth having. It's not worth having because it leaves one alone forever. And being alone forever isn't a description of heaven, it's a description of hell. The heaven that's worth aspiring to is a rejoining of relationship, of community, of partnership, a sense of being in the presence of another in which there is neither a folding of identities that loses their difference nor a sharpening of difference that leads to hostility, but an enjoyment of the other that evokes cherishing and relishing. 
The theological word for this is communion. To explain this, I'm going to describe to you three scenes that I'm guessing will be familiar to us all. And then I want to think with you about what these three scenes have in common. The first is your relationship with the most difficult member of your family. Let's say it's your father. Christmas is coming up, but somehow you have no idea what to give him. It bothers you because deep down it feels like your inability to know what present will please your father is symbolic of your lifelong confusion about what might truly make your father happy, especially where you're concerned. So in the end, you spend more than you meant to on something you don't really believe he wants, pathetically throwing money at the problem but inwardly cursing yourself because you know that what you're buying isn't the answer. When Christmas comes and your father opens the present, you see in his forced smile and his half-hearted hug of thanks that you failed yet again to do something for him that might overcome the chasm between you. Here's a second scene. You have family or friends from out of town coming for Thanksgiving. You want everything to be perfect for them and you exchange a flurry of emails about who's going to sleep where and whether it's all right for them to bring the dog. <laughs> you get into a frenzy of shopping and baking. You're actually a little anxious that you'll forget something or burn something so the kitchen becomes your empire and you can't bear for someone to interrupt you. And even at Thanksgiving dinner you're mostly checking the gravy or reheating the carrots. As you say goodbye to your guests, you hug and say, it's such a shame we didn't really talk while you were here. <laughs> and when they finally left, you collapse in a heap, maybe in tears of exhaustion. Here's a third scene. You feel there's something empty or lacking in the cosy Christmas with family and friends, and your heart is breaking for people having a tough time in the cold, in isolation, in poverty, or in grief. So you gather together presents for children of prisoners or turn all your Christmas gifts into vouchers rep representing your support of a house or a cow or two buffaloes <laughs> for people who need the resources more than you and your friends do. <coughs> what do these scenes have in common? I want to suggest to you that they're based on one tiny word. It's the word for. When we care about those for whom Christmas is a tough time, we want to do something for them. When we want our house guests to enjoy their Thanksgiving visit, our impulse is to spend our whole time doing things for them. Whether cooking dinner or constantly clearing the house or arranging activities to keep them busy. When we feel our relationship with our father is faltering, our instinct is to do something for him that somehow melts his heart and makes everything all right. And those gestures of four matter because they sum up a whole life in which we try to make relationships better, try to make the world better, try to be better people ourselves by doing things for people. We praise the selflessness of those who spend their lives doing things for people. People still sign letters. Do you remember letters? People still sign letters. Your obedient servant. Because we want to tell each other I'm eager to do things for you. When we feel noble, we hum Art Garfunkel singing, like a bridge over troubled water. I will lay me down. <laughs> Presumably for you to walk over me without getting your dainty feet wet. When we feel romantic, we put on the husky voice and turn into Brian Adams singing, everything I do, I do it for you. <laughs> it seems that the word that epitomizes being an admirable person, the word that sums up the spirit of Christianity is for. We cook for, we buy presents for, we offer charity for, all to say we lay ourselves down for. But there's a problem here. All these gestures are good and kind, and in some cases, sacrificial and noble. These are warm-hearted, admirable gestures, but somehow they don't go to the heart of the problem. 
Your, you give your father the gift and the chasm still lies between you. You wear yourself out in showing hospitality, but you've never actually had the conversation with your loved ones. You make fine gestures of charity, but the poor are still strangers to you. For is a fine word, but it doesn't dismantle resentment. It doesn't overcome misunderstanding. It doesn't deal with alienation. It doesn't overcome isolation. Most of all, for is not the way God relates to us. God doesn't simply set the world straight for us. God doesn't simply shower us with good things. God doesn't mount up blessings upon us and then get miserable and stroppy when we open them all up and fail to be sufficiently excited or surprised or grateful. For isn't the heart of God. In some ways we wish it was. We'd love God to make everything happy and surround us with perfect things. When we get cross with God, it's easy to feel God isn't keeping the divine side of the bargain to do things for us now and forever. But God shows us something else. God speaks a rather different word. In Matthew's Gospel, the angel says to Joseph, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. And then in John's Gospel, we get the summary statement of what Christian faith means. The Word became flesh and lived with us. It's an unprepossessing little word, but this is the word that lies at the heart of the Christian faith. The Word is with. Think back to the very beginning of all things. John's Gospel says, the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. Without him, not one thing came into being. In other words, before anything else, there was a with. The with between God and the word, or as Christians came to call it, between the Father and the Son. With is the most fundamental thing about God. And then think about how Jesus concludes his ministry. His very last words in Matthew's Gospel are, Behold, I am with you always. In other words, there will never be a time when I, am, when I am not with. And at the very end of the Bible, when the book of Revelation describes the final disclosure of God's everlasting destiny, this is what the voice from heaven says, Behold, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them we've stumbled upon the most important word in the Bible. The word that describes the heart of God and the nature of God's purpose and destiny for us. And that word is with. That's what God was in the very beginning. That's what God sought to instill in the creation of all things. That's what God was looking for in making the covenant with Israel. That's what God coming among us in Jesus was all about. That's what the sending of the Holy Spirit meant. That's what our destiny in the company of God will look like. It's all in that little word, with. God's whole life and action and purpose are shaped to be with us. In a lot of ways, with is harder than for. You can do for without a conversation, without a real relationship, without a genuine shaping of your life to accommodate and incorporate the other. The reason your Christmas present for your father is doomed is not because four is wrong, not because there's anything bad about generosity. It's because the only solution is for you and your father to be with each other long enough to hear each other's stories and tease out the countless misunderstandings and hurts that have led your relationship beyond the point of being rescued by the right Christmas present. The reason why you collapse in tears when your Thanksgiving guests have gone home is because the hard work is finding out how you can share the different responsibilities and genuinely be with one another in the kitchen and elsewhere that make a stay of several nights a joy of with rather than a burden of four. What makes attempts at Christian charity seem a little hollow is not that they're not genuine and helpful and kind, but what isolated 
and grieving and impoverished people <coughs> usually need is not gifts or money, but the faithful presence with them of someone who really cares about them as a person. It's the with they desperately want. And the for on its own, whether it's food, presence or money, can't make up for the lack of that with. But we all fear the with. Because the with seems to ask more of us than we can give. We'd all prefer to keep charity on the level of four, where it can't hurt us. We all know that more families struggle over Christmas than any other time. Maybe that's because you can spend the whole year being busy doing things for your family. But when there's nothing else to do but be with one another, you realize that being with is actually harder than doing for. And sometimes it's just too hard. Sometimes New Year comes as a relief and we can go back to doing for and leave aside being with for another year. And that's why it's glorious, almost incredible good news that God didn't settle on for. God said unambiguously, I am with. Behold, my dwelling is among you. I've moved into the neighborhood. I will be with you always. My name is Emmanuel, God with us. Sure, there was an element of four in Jesus' life. He was for us when he healed and taught. He was for us when he died on the cross. He was for us when he rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. These are things that only God can do and we can't do. But the power of these things God did for us lies in that they were based on his being with us. God has not abolished four. But God, in becoming flesh in Jesus, has said there will never again be a four that's not based on a fundamental, unalterable, everlasting, and utterly unswerving with. That's the good news of the Incarnation. And how do we celebrate this good news? By being with people in poverty and distress, even when there's nothing we can do for them. By being with people in grief and sadness and loss, even when there's nothing to say. By being with and listening to and walking with those we find most difficult rather than trying to fob them off with a gift or a face-saving gesture. By being still with God in silent prayer rather than rushing in our anxiety to do yet more things for God. By taking the appraisal of all our relationships and asking ourselves, does my doing for arise out of a fundamental commitment to be with or is my doing for driven by my profound desire to avoid the discomfort, the challenge, the patience, the loss of control involved in being with? No one could be more tempted to retreat into doing for than God. God, above all, knows how exasperating, ungrateful, thoughtless and self-destructive company we can be. Most of the time we just want God to fix it and spare us the relationship. But that's not God's way. God could have done it all alone. But God chose not to. God chose to do it with us, even though it cost the cross. That's the amazing news of the word with. The cross is usually portrayed as the ultimate moment of four. The definitive thing only God could do that God did do on our behalf. Let's think about the cross for a moment in the light of what we've seen about the word with. The cross is Jesus' ultimate demonstration of being with us. But in the cruelest irony of all time, it's the instant Jesus finds that neither we nor the Father are with him. Remember Jesus' agonizing words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every aspect of being not with, of being without, clusters together at the foot of the cross. Jesus experiences the reality of human sin because sin is fundamentally living without God. Jesus experiences the depth of suffering because suffering is more than anything else the condition of being without comfort. Jesus experiences the horror of death because death is the word we give to being without all things, without breath, without connectedness, without consciousness, without a body. Jesus experiences the biggest alienation of all the state of being without the Father, and thus being not God, being, for this moment, without the with 
that is the essence of God. Jesus gives everything that he is for the cause of being with us, for the cause of embracing us within the essence of God's being. He's given so much even despite our determination to be without him. And yet he's given beyond our imagination because for the sake of our being with the Father, he has for this moment lost his own being with the Father. And the Father has longed so much to be with us that he has for this moment lost his being with the Son, which is the essence of his being. Here's the astonishing good news at this central moment in history. Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, God had to choose between being with the Father or being with us. And he chose us. At the same time, the Father had to choose between letting the Son be with us or keeping the Son to himself, and he chose to let the Son be with us. That is the choice on which our eternal destiny depends. That is the epicenter of the Christian faith and our very definition of love. From this moment, we can see that the word with becomes the key to the whole story. The Holy Trinity is the perfect epitome of with, God being with God. The incarnation of Jesus is the embodiment of with, God being with us, being among us. The crucifixion, as we've seen, is the greatest test of God's being with us because we see that God in Christ is so committed to being with us that Jesus will even risk his being with God to keep his commitment never to be separated from us. The resurrection is the vindication of God's being both with us and with God, and the ultimate and perpetual compatibility and unity of the two. Pentecost is the embodiment of that resurrection breakthrough because in Pentecost the Holy Spirit becomes the guarantee and gift of our union with God in Christ and our union with one another in Christ's body. So, You've had my hypothesis that our culture assumes the fundamental human problem is mortality. And you've had my argument that the fundamental human problem isn't mortality, instead it's isolation. And I've expounded that argument by showing how in the word with what I call the most important word, we see the essence of what it means to be God and the essence of what it means to be human. Now in this last part of my lecture, I want to show why this distinction between mortality and isolation is so important to the church's mission and the world's service. It's not difficult to see how a philosophy based on overcoming mortality and a philosophy based on overcoming isolation can come into tension with one another. As humanity's quest to overcome mortality has gathered pace, the degree of human isolation has increased with it. For sure, enhanced transportation, telecommunications, and information technology have made it, made it possible to communicate in ever more extensive and complex ways. But they've also facilitated lifestyles where people are in touch with conversation partners on the other side of the planet, but not with next door neighbors. Where insurance lies in investments and pensions rather than in friendships and extended families and where face-to-face -face human interaction is ceasing to become the encounter of choice for a generation who are used to having plentiful alternative ways to make themselves known to one another. The flip side of making ourselves more independent and self-sufficient is that we're simultaneously becoming more isolated and more alone. Now you might expect me to blame the 1%. You might expect me to say that our great corporations and enterprises are so wholly given over to the project of overcoming mortality that they've exacerbated and accelerated this problem. But I don't believe that to be the case. Because while great organizations trumpet their signal achievements and spectacular aspirations, most of the good they do is on a rather humbler level. They provide opportunities for people to work together. They facilitate the livelihoods of households by sustaining people who earn a good wage to uphold their families. They pay a great deal of money directly and indirectly in tax, and therefore undergird the fabric of government and society. They bring people into regular, productive and sociable contact with one another, offering them a forum 
for the establishment of collaborations, partnerships and friendships. These are all significant ways in which our nation's institutions and businesses contribute to the overcoming of isolation and thus, I suggest, to the central good of humankind. Remember, the root of the word company is the word companion. Companies are made up of companions. Companions are people who literally share bread and figuratively share life with one another. Just think about what people miss when they retire or become unemployed. They miss the paycheck, of course, and the benefits, but most of all, they miss the rhythm and ordering of life. The camaraderie and companionship of colleagues, the challenge and novelty of what each day may bring, and the satisfaction of sharing a goal and a project with others. There are many people whose lives are not characterized by fruitful and rewarding participation in an organization of this kind. Such people are likely to fall among those that come to be regarded as potential objects or recipients of service. But here's the crucial point. If you see the central quest of life as being to overcome isolation, rather than to overcome mortality, your notion of service and of mission will change accordingly. Service and mission that seek to overcome isolation don't look to technology to solve problems or reduce limitations. They don't assume that their own knowledge and skill are the crucial element required to change the game. Of course, if you're in the business of overcoming mortality, you're going to need plenty of knowledge and skill. But if you're in the business of overcoming isolation, then you begin to appreciate that concentrating on enhancing and promoting your own knowledge and skill may be as likely to be counterproductive as productive. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul cites one compelling metaphor for what Christ has done in bringing salvation. Paul says, in his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. Paul is referring to the hostility between Jew and Gentile but the point goes for any such degree of antagonism and alienation. Indeed, the greater the degree of isolation or antagonism, the more profound the significance of overcoming it. Thus, service and mission become recognizing those from whom one is alienated and antagonized and seeking and finding ways to be present to them. Mission and service are not primarily using one's skills in conflict resolution to bring peace between warring parties, but instead perceiving contexts in which one is war one of the warring parties and submitting oneself to a process of making peace. The approach that sees overcoming mortality as the goal tends to approach mission and service like this. We as outsiders to social disadvantage and thus not in any significant way part of the problem, nonetheless have expert eyes to see what the problem is and ready-made solutions to hand. We will appear in the local context, deliver our solution and then withdraw quickly to resume our regular activities which are not considered to have any material bearing, positive or negative, on the problem we've identified and resolved. If we've listened to and learned from repeated interventions of this kind, we will have gathered that it's good to form relationships on the ground, good to involve local participants in some way, else local wisdom be neglected and local goodwill be needlessly undermined. But the point is that this local participation is never more than a means to an end. The end is never in question. The end always comes in the form of overcoming the limitations of local environment or skill base and the provision of technology or the enhancement of the capacity to use it. Contrast this with the kind of mission and service that emerge from a conviction that the goal is to overcome isolation. We're not exactly sure what the problem is, but we take for granted that we're a part of it. We do not assume that the solution is to make other people more like us by ensuring that they have what we have and live as we live. We assume that we have a deficiency and that deficiency is due to the poverty or absence of our relationship with those who have important and invigorating things to share with us. If only we could open up channels to receive those things. We may well embark on projects that seek to alleviate distress or transfer resources or develop skills, but the point of these projects is not to achieve a specific material goal. These endeavors are simply means of forming relationships from a safe common starting point. These projects are ladders that will fall away once the relationships are in place and genuine dialogue is happening. What we might call the mortality model 
insists that what's required is the introduction of new information, new technique, new technology. The isolation model asserts that in most cases a people or a neighborhood has everything it needs for its own redemption. What inhibits such redemption is the energy lost in isolation and wasted in antagonism. For leaders of churches, colleges and other institutions, there is a curious irony in all of this. Such leaders do more to further the overcoming of isolation by the way they run their institution and by the way their institution fosters healthy relationships among its members and staff than their institution does by such service projects as it under undertakes. Because in all the haste to provide technology and enhance technique and alleviate the limitations of climate or scarcity or skill, mortality mo motivated service can often underline and even enhance the kinds of social alienation that from the isolation perspective constitute the problem in the first place. I was once asked to do a bit of consultancy work for an organization that had a significant service arm. I talked to the board of the organization's service arm. What are you looking for in the service projects you coordinate? I asked them. We want to see impact. People like that always say, impact. <laughs> we want to see transformation. We want to make a difference. Try as I might, I couldn't get the members of that board to see that not all impact is welcomed by its participants, especially that kind of impact. <laughs> Not all transformation is for the better, and a lot of people in the history of the world have made a difference. But not all of those differences have been beneficial ones. The kind of service that board was talking about didn't seem to be serving anyone but themselves. It didn't seem to occur to them that they might be affirming and exacerbating the social divisions and inequalities that they found. Like many professional people, they like to use the phrase, give something back. I tried gently to point out to them that such a phrase assumed the rather problematic premise that what they'd spent most of their career doing was taking something away. <laughs> and that perhaps they'd do better to focus on stopping taking away rather than trying to give something back. <laughs> what bothered me most about the whole conversation was that here were a bunch of thoughtful, successful people. But they didn't seem to be going about giving something back with the same degree of thoughtfulness to which they'd given the original taking away that had made them so successful in the first place. So here is my conclusion. Jesus spent three hours or perhaps three days in Jerusalem working for us, doing what we could not do, achieving our salvation. He spent three years in Galilee working with us like a community organizer, building a social movement and empowering his followers. But before that, he spent no less than 30 years in Nazareth, simply being with us, sharing the texture of our lives, enjoying us and walking in our shoes. Think about those percentages. Do the math. Well over 90% of Jesus' time among us, he was simply with us. And his last words were, I am with you always. Of course we're all worried that we're going to die. There's a place for addressing the problem of mortality and God does address the problem. But if God had just dealt with mortality, we'd still be in deep trouble. Because mortality's not our central problem. Our central problem is isolation from God and one another. And this is the crucial point. Our efforts to overcome mortality often only exacerbate our problem of isolation. God is Trinity. God is limitless, eternal, embracing with. Salvation is God's extension of that with to include us. Our mission and our service should have that one simple goal in mind, to imitate the love of God and communicate in silent presence, caring touch and timely words. You'll never walk alone.
we have some time for question and answer. So if you have a question, we have a mic. And we'll bring around to you. And yes, do you have a question? So Daniel, will you ask Dr. Wells to repeat the question so that we have him on our uh, web broadcast? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Keeps coming to mind the verse, there's no greater love than this and to lay down your life for another. And I'm wondering your thoughts on that and if it's not just a kenotic wit. Because where does kenosis fit in this, that complete self-emptying that seems to be a four prior to the wit? Or is it just a kenotic wit that looks like a four? I don't know. Um. I think it's a kenotic width that looks like a four. Uh, let's look at one or two examples. Um, in the tale of two cities, uh, Sydney and Charles fall for the same woman. Charles gets the woman um, and marries her, but Sydney remains in love with Lucy for the rest of the book. And Sydney feels uh, ashamed of his life and decides that the one thing, uh, Sydney and Charles look identical, like identical twins. And so Sydney decides that when Charles is put in prison in France in the 1790s, what he's going to do is he's going to kind of kidnap Charles and substitute himself for Charles. And the, the, um, and the novel finishes with, it's a far, far better thing that I do now than I've ever done. It's a far, far better rest that I go to than I've ever known. And, uh, and it, there's clearly something uh, Chris, Christ-like about that. But there's still something that's clearly not quite satisfactory. <laughs> because this, there's this incredible gesture for Lucy. And, and as a kind of, um, it's a kind of gesture to redeem a life. And it's a beautiful gesture. Um, but you know, if, if one imagines what life was like for Charles after that gesture, I think it's a, it's a very hard gesture to receive, despite the fact given his life. And I think, in the language I was using tonight, I would say because it's a little bit too much for. Whereas the, um, the kenosis that we see in the Passion, I think, is exactly the kind that you're describing. It's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a four based on a fundamental, absolutely unbreakable with, you know, in, in, in Bart's language, God's, uh, God's decision never to be, except to be with us in Christ. I mean, that's, that's a fundamental with. When Bart uses the word four, he means on our side, not in, in our place, <coughs> in, that, in, that, in that context, when, you know, Bart often uses four and with together in, in terms of that decision. Um, you know, for rather than against. <laughs> you know, is that, so it's that slightly confusing, I think. Um, but, but, but I think, I think you've, you've kind of answered your own question in the sense that, that I, I, I see it as a, uh, as a, a, a kind of canotic with that's, that refuses ever to be, to be separated. You know, nothing can separate us. I can ask you the questions. <laughs> oh. Well, I want to know if there's a partially spoken plea for contemplation in what you're saying, behind what you're saying. And um, just thinking about it, you spoke that possibly the hardest person to be with is myself, and maybe the second hardest is God. And everyone else is incredibly hard. <laughs> and, um, that uh, by contemplation, I'm not sure what I mean, but it has to do with being in a state of being and perceiving and not doing, and practicing often by oneself, not trying to make things happen, either mentally or physically. And all that seemed to, to fit with what you were saying, but I wondered what you thought about it. 
Yeah, again, uh, the, the, so the question is, I don't think I repeated the last question, did I? Uh, the question is whether, um, uh, whether this language of with is a, is, is a um, rhetorical way of, uh, of uh, inviting us to, to be with ourselves and to be with God, uh, which are in some ways precursors and in many cases harder than being with other people. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, again, I would say you've described it very well. Um, that's, uh, uh, you know, and I, but I, I, and I do think, you know, personally, that's, that certainly affects the way that I pray because I'm, I'm really, um, I'm not saying um, God, please fix the result of the Republican primary in, Lu <laughs> in Louisiana, you know, so that finally Ron Paul will get <laughs> what we all long for him to get. Um, but God, be with, be with Ron Paul like never before um, in ways that that may transform America, but will certainly transform Ron Paul. Um, and that's the same prayer that I'm asking for myself. <laughs> um, it is, uh, as I said in my remarks, we, for is easier than with most of the time, and we want God to do for us, you know, we, and spare us the relationship. But prayer is coming into the presence of God, saying this is about the relationship and any, any end product is a bonus. Um, I think you speak very personally about um, the hardest person to be with is oneself. I think there is a kind of, I think there are different ways to be alone. You know, I think there are uh, people who love to be with other people and need to remember that um, you know, perhaps in some cases particularly, I mean, it's easy to talk about priests in this company, you know, they have a very important job to do and they need to, to, to withdraw for a period of time to remember that sometimes, rather than just to be a people pleaser or whatever the temptation might happen to be. Um, and so there's an element of four in that, which I think is appropriate. Um, but if you know, if you if you say you know, and I put it fairly simply in the lecture, if you say that the Holy Trinity is the three persons of the Trinity being with one another forever, um, and if you see if you say that salvation is being with God and one another forever, then um, then it, it makes you think that maybe this being with thing is quite important. <laughs> that we should spend more time, <laughs> Sp time more time on it now, so we'll be better at it when the time comes. And I, I think I think being with oneself has to be has to be part of that. I mean, I think I see that as being the um, you know what's sometimes called the two greatest commandments, but are really the three greatest commandments. You know, love God, love the neighbour, and love the self. Thank you. This is the point in the evening when any twitch will be regarded as a possible, <laughs> possible question. Uh, in your first saying, you, you nailed me with the description of the, the father. My father is 90. I was just with him this past week in Mississippi, and we've had a difficult relationship over the years. And I was thinking that the five days that I was there, I did everything I could so that I did not have to be with him. Um, because it is a, has been a difficult relationship. And uh, I think there's been forgiveness there, but it's still very hard. Uh, so that is, I think you, you really nail um, forgiveness and reconciliation, particularly with family members who we love. Uh, but I want to see if you have any wisdom to impart um, from your own experience, perhaps, uh, in, um, in being more intentional. Uh, if I try to sit 
down with you and say, okay, Dad, I want to be with you. You know, it'd be really hard. But I just want to see if you have anything else to say about that particular um, interaction with those who we love most. Um. Well, I'll, I'll, the, the question is, a, is about uh, if I have any practical uh, advice about being with the people that we find it hard to love, but are called to love. Um, I think I'll give a, a sort of a general answer and a specific answer to that, if I may. The general answer is that I have, I have four questions that I commend to people um, in making relationships across social disadvantage, they certainly have a place within the family as well, because the, it's really making relationships across the dividing wall of hostility, as Paul calls it. Um, and the first, um, the first one is, uh, tell me about a way in which you're rich. And the second one is, tell me about a way in which you're poor. And the third is, let me tell you about the ways in which I'm poor, and the fourth is, let me tell you about the ways in which I'm rich. And I, um, I, I just try to create situations where that kind of conversation can take place in a, in a way that doesn't seem forced. <laughs> um, so that would be the general answer in terms of difficult relationships. And of course, you know, depending on whether the person is eight years old or 88 years old, you, you know, you modify the the form of the question, but you, but the content is more or less the same. Um, and so, I, I mean, again, in terms of your father, I would say, yeah, you modify the form of the question, but um, uh, but the content is more or less the same. That's to say, um, you know, if if you're 88 years old, and all your life is constituted by relationships in which you're the needy one, you know, it's a humiliating existence, perhaps particularly, uh, either if you spent all your life like that, or if you haven't spent the earlier part of your life like that, and now you find yourself constrained to be in such a place. Um, and so I think the place to begin is, tell me about the ways in which you're rich, you know, because uh, the most, you know, the most healing power is gratitude. Um, and the way you love someone is to see their abundance, not their scarcity. Um, so that's the place I would begin. Um, but then, you know, compassion is, ab is about seeing the scarcity as real or perceived. Um, and then volunteering your own scarcity, particularly if you're someone who's seen as a person of abundance. Uh, but not pretending that scarcity is the whole, and therefore, you know, the fourth question is about your own abundance, but your own abundance ideally would include him, uh, you know, finding a way to articulate. Um, but in terms of reconciliation more generally, um, reconciliation begins with telling a truthful story. You don't need Desmond Tutu to tell us that, you know, I mean, that's, and so it does have to include saying the things that are really hard to say, and 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 um, one of the hard things to say is, you know, I really don't look forward to coming to see you, but I I wish I did, and I kind of wonder if maybe you don't look forward to me coming, and so we've come to this arrangement by which I do all the jobs that uh, I could possibly think of to do for you and a few more that don't need doing. And then, you know, that's like the middle of the Venn diagram. <laughs> that's the overlap place where we both think this will be adequate. But actually we both know it's not, it's not, it's not what we're looking for. And sure, that's what new mothers do with their in-laws. You know, they find jobs for them to do around the house because they can't bear the vulnerability of being off work and having to face 48 hours of the in-laws. They, they, you know, that's just, you know, but, but again, the same conversation, more or less. It's, you know. And, yeah, I've, I've had those conversations. 
and I still need to have them in some places, <laughs> no doubt about it. I think we have one down here. I work at school, and so you know, service learning, service admission is an important part of our organization, just like many organizations. And so I guess my question is sort of a practical one in that um, how would you envision sort of our current model of service and mission in organizations like churches and schools um, being transformed into something more incarnational and relational? not just the giving and the floor. Um, yeah, so the question is about, in a school context, you're talking about a high school context. One through 12. One, right. Um, and how in schools and churches, the kind of philosophy that I'm advocating could be more imbued into those kind of contexts. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of my things I do for my sins is to, into, to interview students for one of the scholarship programs at Duke. And so you see, <laughs> um, you see these bulging CVs, and then I, I host a dinner for the finalists, you know, where they're trying to show how humble they are despite their extraordinary talents. <laughs> um, with mixed success. Um, but of course, from time to time, someone will slip into the conversation that they've done 2,000 hours of community service. And because, I'm, as you understand, I'm highly professional, I resist the temptation to say, if it was really service, you wouldn't be counting. But that's, that's kind of where we've got to, <laughs> as you probably know better than I do. <laughs> um, and I think I've spent a lot of my seven years at, at Duke doing precisely I mean, precisely trying to answer your question. Because, um, no, let me be, let me, let me, let's just pretend that I don't speak with an English accent for the next 10 seconds, okay? So hear this, but not as a criticism of America, <coughs> really, but from someone who loves America so much that I've spent the last seven years here and loved every minute of it. The relationship between Duke and Durham is, one in which nobody can possibly imagine why, if you had the choice between the two, you wouldn't choose Duke. That's the problem with the relationship. You know, it's Yale New Haven, to use another example. Like, I'm not sufficiently of a Texan to understand that. Um, it's surprisingly like the relationship between America and the rest of the world. Um, and if an American says to me, why does the rest of the world hate us? I say, it's because nobody I've met in America co can possibly imagine why anyone would want to live anywhere else. <laughs> and if people at Duke say to me, why do people in Durham hate us? I say, it's because of the same problem. <laughs> we just think we're it. Um, and it re it re what, it re what, re what it requires is for people, as I said, you know, towards the end of my lecture, it is for us to discover our, our profound neediness. I mean, it, it, it also requires us to read the Bible. <laughs> you know, if you read the story of the Good Samaritan and you're in a service learning program, you know that story because you are the Samaritan. But you're not the Samaritan. You're the man in the ditch and you're having to receive the, the you, salvation from somebody who nobody in your culture would ever talk to. And so the journey of service learning isn't to clock up 2,000 hours. It's to make the journey not only to think, but to know and believe in your heart and your gut that you are in the ditch and you need the Samaritan and the Samaritan doesn't live in your zip code, but probably lives in a zip code that has the same four no first four numbers, just not the same last one. And if you don't hang out with them, you'll never receive your salvation. That's a, that's a change of, and actually, you don't go into that relationship saying, I'm the solution now, you're the problem now, let's do this as quickly as we can, which is the way most service learning in my experience operates. Um, 
it requires that, I mean, to me, the, these kind of values, you know, you, do you know what, what I learned a lot of this at seminary? <laughs> because in my first term at seminary, on a Wednesday afternoon, we used to go to Gogoburn Hospital in Edinburgh, and we used to sit with severely mentally and physically disabled young people and spend three hours just sitting with them and playing with them. And, you know, I had nothing to give them. And I ha it took me a term to work out ways to receive from them. Um, and I still don't think I was very good at it by the end. But, but going into a, a place where I, there was nothing I could do to make their life better. <laughs> but it was still worth being there. And just go through, you know, it's like a, it's like a ghastly Kubler-Ross grief process. You know, you have to go through all the phases where you start by bringing people endless cups of tea and realizing they don't want cups of tea. <laughs> you know, you go, you have to go, and so, I mean, so if you want in a one-liner, I think, you know, putting people in those situations and letting them find out for themselves. I think it's the job of clergy and people who run parishes and run schools and things to find ways, to create ways, you know, to facilitate those things. So, I mean, um, I wrote a book called Living Without Enemies, I don't know if it's one of the ones that's around tonight, but uh, uh, which was really about uh, the journey a friend of mine made from, uh, in terms of addressing gun violence in Durham, from um, starting by trying to change the laws in Raleigh, which she did pretty successfully until the NRA managed to pass some laws through that said that any laws made about guns in local, you know, um, units were invalid. You know, very clever. Um, so, you know, she really made the journey from working for to working with to being with, and we narrate in the book about how she did that. I wrote it with her. Um, but one of the things that she now does is she uh, arranges re-entry teams for people coming out of prison because one of the sort of conversion moments for her, as she described it, was when she realised that the people getting shot and the people doing the shooting were pretty similar people, sometimes the same people. Um, so what, uh, before that point, she'd been arranging vigils on the site of homicides in Durham for a number of years. and I've been to a lot of those. And um, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's a half hour commitment, six o'clock in the evening with a few days notice. You know, most people can find a way to do that. Even if they're stuck at home with the kids, they can get a spouse to come home a little bit earlier that night. So, they, you know, so there's a, an element of being with about that. But clearly there's, what that lacks is an ongoing relationship, which is pretty crucial to being with. Uh, so when she started, she created re-entry teams when some, um, some men walked past the, a vigil and said, you know, you're doing a good thing here. And it turned out that six weeks later, one of them had been shot. And, it, and actually, she'd also discovered that they'd walked past the vigil because they were coming out of prison after being in prison for a good deal of time. And uh, so what happens in these re-entry teams is that we have one at Duke Chapel and one of the vice presidents at Duke's in it, one of the... Um, support staff for, for the uh, president or the se secretary to the university's office is in it and you know a bunch of busy professional people are in that um, that team a guy who works for IBM uh, and they sit down for an hour every two weeks again most people can find an hour every two weeks um, 
and there's <laughs> five or six of them in the team, and then there's a, uh, a, uh, there's a partner who's just come out of prison, having done something pretty ugly. And they're together for nine months, meeting every two weeks for an hour. Uh, and then if it goes well, which it has in every, one but every case but one out of the nine they've had in that team, that partner becomes a member, and then they have a new partner. And so the team gets bigger as each partner becomes a member. And so then you're really turning prisoners from, you know, needing support to, to giving wisdom. Uh, and of course, the truth of what happens is that the group realise that they're all in prison, in one kind or another, and they start to talk about the ways in which they themselves are in prison. And certainly the vice president, that you probably wouldn't mind me saying, you know, he, um, he worked for one of the major accounting firms and he realised that he was in prison and <laughs> being a partner for one of those, you know, and, and he's got a, you know, a significant story that he's articulated through being part of that team of, of how, you know, how imprisoned he was in that life. Um, so it takes someone like my friend to arrange those kind of things. It's very hard for someone to say, oh, I'm going to befriend, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody who's, who's killed somebody. You know, I'm just going to go out and make a friend of someone who's killed. So you, you know, you, do, you just don't know how to begin to do that. So, yeah, it's for a whole criminal justice resource centre and social workers and, you know, a whole bunch of people. It's, that's what those people's jobs are, <laughs> to create those sorts of relationships, uh, which can be sustained for, for years. Um, and so, but, but as my friend has discovered, um, I don't think she uses the word justice anything like as much as she used to. However, I think she uses the word salvation more than she used to because that's what's going on in those situations. She used to think that justice was going to rally changing the laws about handguns in Durham. Um, and that would have been great. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd love the laws about handguns. Uh, there's no justification for anyone in Durham needing a handgun. None whatsoever. I'd love those laws to change tomorrow. Uh, that would be justice in some ways. But that's not going to happen um, in any foreseeable way, but w o over the period of about 15 years, she realised there were some other things that she could do, and so that's what she's done. So I don't think there's a lot of people who can't find an hour every two weeks, however difficult it may be for them to be with, you know, you just have to be with in more constrained, organised ways, and that's, you know, there's no church in America that couldn't have a re-entry re team on that kind of level. and you know, you guys who are at seminary now <coughs> are going to be priests and you're going to spend, um, well, I wouldn't even describe some of the things you're going to spend a large amount of your ministry doing. <laughs> but let's just imagine you're going to spend ridiculous amounts of time providing a um, preschool nursery for over-affluent children of under-imaginative parents. Um, you know, in a downtown setting where everyone has to drive 10 miles to get there, and it's not an appropriate setting, it's not necessarily furthering any kind of mission of the church. And it's just, I mean, it's just off the top of my head. You know, if you just took a fraction of that time per week, you know, you could, you could, you could see yourself as someone who, who organised something like this and maybe was a member of the team yourself. So, I, I don't think it has to be an either-or. You know, I'm too busy to be with, I'm too needy to be with, I'm too, um, you know, overworked, over, over stressed at home or whatever it might be. I think um, it just requires imagination. I mean, that is, you know, that, that is what the priest should be in the community, the agent of imagination, who, who says, yeah, okay, so you're, you've got 55 children of your own and life is difficult at home and you're also holding down a 60-hour-a-week job. I appreciate life is quite demanding for you at the moment. Um, but actually, I think this is something that really would work for you. You know, I have a conversation like that about twice a week at the moment. But the great thing about my job is I don't have to do all the organising of those activities. I just, I just have lunch with the posh people who want to give something back. <laughs> and I say, I've got just the thing for you. For you. There was, was there one more? Or tell me when we, we expire.
So, um, from the question, people seem to be pretty happy with the win. Um, <coughs> if one were being perhaps slightly, you've kind of vilified the, the four a little bit, I might suggest. You used the word, you know, you, you talked about the exacerbated problem sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, so where does what you've said leave the four? I think it depends who you are. You know, I think it, if it dep if you're the if you're the person that's given the uh, expensive but useless Christmas present to your father for the last twenty years, it leaves you with some big questions to ask. Um, but I think. Uh, any kind of ministry is going to include some level of four at some stage. Uh, you know, I mean, I think it really depends on context. I think I've sort of gone on a bit of a crusade about the with. Um, first of all, because I really do believe what I said theologically about the with. <laughs> I really think eternally the with has it. Um, but also because I, s I, I, and I think on a personal level, this is my reaction to much of what I both love but also struggle with about mainline Christianity in America, is that it's, um, it's construed mission so overwhelmingly about four. Uh, and, you know, the, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm grieved for the recipients of that mission, but I'm most of all grieved by the people offering that mission, because I think their own ministry has been impoverished by that. Um, uh, you know, I, I talk about being for, being with, working with and working for quite a lot, and I think <coughs> a healthy life and a healthy community includes all of those. It's not like one of them's boo, ah, hiss. Um, and when I talk about these things, I I, as you say, I, I possibly uh, rhetorically um, stress the one uh, for rhetorical effect to some extent. Um, if I thought there was, and, and, and I, when I teach that ethics and unjust world class, we talk about for and with a lot, They're not in quite the same theological terms. Um, and I usually get the question, you know, what if all of us stopped being pre-med and we all went off and lived in large communities or something like that? And I always give the same answer. If I thought there was the slightest danger, <laughs> I might think differently. But I don't see the remotest danger. <laughs> um, and, and usually, you know, there's, uh, there's one or two students a year who come and see me a year later and say, I changed my, um, my major or something like that. In fact, there was one... There was, I gave a lecture, not this, not, not, not this lecture, but a, a lecture about, uh, about the kind of themes I ended with today about how Jesus spent 30 years in Nazareth, and so maybe show, so should we. And uh, at the end of the lecture, one of the students put up his hand and said, yeah, this is a Duke student, you get this. Um, you know, I, I liked your lecture, but it's, you know, it's a bit difficult for me because I'm really smart. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm quoting here. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, and, and I've, I'm very talented and it's just really hard to feel I'm going to waste, you know, if I follow what you're saying, I'm just going to waste all these abilities. Um, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, but, you know, don't you think it was quite difficult for Jesus as well? Because, you know, he was quite talented. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but he, he seemed to have. Um, so, it is partly for rhetorical effect. There is a place for four. I, so for example, I, I certainly think uh, government is a good thing, and there's a lot of four in government. But again, this, the same point's true. Representative democracy only works if you believe your representatives are with the people <laughs> that they're representing. Um, medicine, sure, I, I'd like um, you know, I've had my health problems in my time. <laughs> but, boy, is there a difference between going into a hospital <laughs> and some faceless person doing some operation on you and the same person sitting on the side of the bed two days before <laughs> and just saying, I, I haven't done one of these operations before and I don't know exactly what we're going to find. Um, 
but I'm going to do my best and I've done a lot of operations and I think you can trust me. That's a very different experience. Um, so even in the most four of professions, there's a with way to do it. Uh, that's my minimum. <laughs> um, but, but so often, as with Thanksgiving and Christmas, my experience is that four is a substitute for with. And it takes somebody sometimes to just knock you over the head and say, come on, <laughs> we know what we're talking about. So, it's a good question. Okay, well, I think, thank you very much, um, Dr. Wells, that was excellent. Uh, we are going to have a reception here um, next. Uh, we also have continuing education certificates, uh, if anyone is interested in those. They'll be at the table. There's a, we have a table of Dr. Wells' books, and he's going to be available to sign books if you're interested in him signing a book that you have. So thank you again.